Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Doug Klaus. I'm chairman of the board of the Type Directors Club. And welcome to our virtual salon today with Angelina Lippert. And we're really, you should see, um, we're excited to get started, but I have a few announcements first, and I have a visual aid here for that. Um, first, we want to encourage you to become a Type Directors Club member um, to help make events and recordings like these possible. And there's a little link below here on the screen um, for where you can do that. And also I pasted this information in the chat window, so it's always accessible during this. Um, we also ask, we have uh, scholarships that we give to students studying type, and we ask you to contribute to scholarships if you can. And there's a link for that as well. So welcome today to Angelina Lippert. And um, also, I want to say that um, Angelina will speak, and then we'll have some Q&A. Please put your questions into the Q&A panel, not the chat, the chat panel, and that's where we'll, we'll be getting the questions. Okay. So I want to introduce Angelina um, for those of you who don't know her, which is, um, so Angelina is the chief curator at Poster House, which is a new museum in New York City. Well, Fairly, it's still new. I think we can call it new. Yeah, we haven't had our first birthday yet, so. <laughs> You're new. Um, and it's devoted to posters um, of all kinds. And Angelina holds an MA in Art of the Russian Avant-Garde from the Kortold Institute of Art in London, a BA in Theology and Art History from Smith College. Prior to working at Poster House, she served 10 years as a poster specialist at a leading New York auction house. And she's produced dozens of auction catalogs and articles, as well as the book. That was a book, Angela, the Art Deco poster? Oh, the Art Deco, big book, big book. <laughs> okay, would you call it a coffee table book? It is so coffee table ready. <laughs> okay, and she's lectured at SVA and the Cooper Union. Uh, she's on the board of directors for the Ephemeral Society of America, and her research interests include German expressionism, Soviet film posters, and the history of food and wine in advertising. And today, you're Angelina, you're reading like a very old bio of me, I see. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay, would you like to add anything to that? No, 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 that, that, that's great. It's great. I haven't heard that version in a long time. Okay. Um, and uh, today, Angelina is going to talk about public service announcement posters. Yes. So, take it away. Awesome. Okay, here we, here we go. Are you seeing what I'm, a uh, uh, slideshow? Yes. Awesome. Great. Um, well, first I'm going to start with giving you a little introduction to Poster House since I was told by Doug that not everybody knows what Poster House is. Um, so I'll give you a brief int introduction to the institution before I talk about the history of PSA posters. And um, I'm pr pretty easy as a lecturer, so if you want to drop questions into the Q&A tab for Doug while I talk, I, he can interrupt me anytime he wants. Um, he and I are friends, so I don't mind if he interrupts me. <laughs> um, now, Poster House is, a very new, is very new in the muse museum landscape in New York City. Uh, while we were founded in 2017, we didn't have a renovated building until a year ago. Um, so our birthday is June 20th, and we really have only been a functional museum for just, just less than a year. Um, so what you're looking at right now is our facade on 23rd Street in New York City, which is right near the Flatiron Building, or if you're like me and you're, you need like a food landmark, Italy. Now, when you enter the museum, you'll see our lovely gift shop on the left, which features all manner of design items. And our architects wanted to bring the feeling of the street into the space. So we've used a lot of organic materials like clay, brick, cement, to make it seem like a thoroughfare going from 23rd to 24th Street. And the building is a perfect through and through. So you literally can cut through the block inside our space. And those columns that you see are part of the original structure, which was a cloak factory at the turn of the century. Uh, they're cast iron and were definitely a design challenge, but we built out the upstairs, like while we were building out the upstairs galleries. Now, if you did a quick pivot to the right, as soon as you entered the space, you'd see our secret photo booth. And it's, it's essentially a green screen where you can insert yourself into classic posters in history. We add a few new options every season, and try to incorporate a poster that you might see in one of our shows. So yes, that is me, and that is my ex-boyfriend. He's a massive ham. <laughs> now, across from our ticket booth is what we call our digital poster wall. 
It's essentially a giant screen embedded into the clay wall, which cycles through about 150 posters in our permanent collection, which are not currently on display, but which show the breadth and depth of our collection. And under each image is a little fun fact about it, as well as the artist, when it was made, and the country of origin. Um, we change these out all the time, and if you're lucky, you'll find a secret button near the coat check, which allows you to control the flipping of these images. Um, now, one part about our collection I love to see in the digital poster wall is what we call the living archive. So in addition to collecting historic posters, we also have a special mandate that requires us to collect the best posters being made now. So we have literally thousands of posters from over 100 countries represented in our collection right now. And a lot of the most interesting ones are pieces being made around the world today. These two images that you see are just some of my favorites. On the left, a Canadian poster for um, Top Comic on Sirius XM Radio. And on the right, a dish soap poster from Hong Kong. And then my absolute favorite, an enema poster from Japan. And a retro-inspired poster for the Wisconsin dairy industry. That one actually is currently hanging in our cafe. Um, now, next to the digital poster wall, across from our cafe, is the Jewel Box Gallery. Uh, this is an image from the first show we featured in that space a year ago, which was Designing Through the Wall, Cyan in the 1990s, a show about the incorporation of Photoshop by the group Cyan into cultural advertising and how they broke with many of the, quote, rules of what makes an effective poster. Uh, now, you see that wall that the posters are hung on? That is the largest rotating wall in New York City. At least that's what our architects told us. Um, so you'll see in later photos of shows that we rotate that wall out to combine this jewel box space with our larger main gallery to create a super mega gallery. Um, so just so if you went out the door to this gallery and moved into the gallery space next door, you would have seen this show up a year ago. Alphonse Mucha, Art Nouveau, Nouvelle Femme. I wanted to open the museum with an artist who most people were familiar with. Um, if not by name, then certainly by his imagery. And now, oddly, there had not been a show of Mooka's work in New York City since 1921, when the Brooklyn Museum did a show of his work. And our exhibition designer, Ola, wanted to make sure that the design of the show felt exciting and modern, because these posters at that time, when they went up, were incredibly exciting and modern. Now, on the left here, you'll see Mooka's signature macaroni hair being turned into a swirling graphic on the wall. Also, that orange wall is the other side of the rotating wall that I mentioned earlier. And if you're super interested in MUCA, I'm giving a two hour lecture on the entire show and some things that didn't make it into the show later th this month and it's on the museum's events page. Now, after MUCA, I curated a show called Baptized by Beefcake, the Golden Age of hand-painted movie posters from Ghana, which explored the advent of traveling Western cinema in Ghana during the 80s and 90s and how religious spaces were used to screen these films as a means of exhibiting moral tales. Now, meanwhile, in our lower level space, called the Programs Gallery, down here, we showed a selection of posters from the 2017 Women's March. Our collections manager curated that show, linking imagery and content within some 300 posters, incidentally, out of over 3,000 posters we received from the march itself. Um, and she linked that content of those historic post of those posters with historic causes within the history of American protest. So, for example, she had a section on Black Lives Matter and created a timeline showcasing major civil rights protests in the United States since 1917. Our education department is actually about to release a multi-platform educational tool that allows visitors to interact and engage with these historic protests. Now, across from the programs gallery is one of my favorite spaces in the museum. It is our children's exhibition area based on 1960s New York. Uh, this is a, a mural like on a dry erase board that you can color. Um, uh, there's examples of three iconic 1960s posters that you can color separate um, in CMYK. And there's even a mini newsstand with payphones that make funny noises. And oddly, this space is incredibly popular with adults and teenagers. <laughs> Uh, now, finally, on view upstairs right now, which will be running through February 2021, once we reopen, is The Sleeping Giant, Posters in the Chinese Economy, which Doug just so happened to create the impressive exhibition design for with his business partner, Angela. Um, they also created the amazing installation downstairs for my show, The Swiss Grid, which documents the history behind mid-century Swiss design. Now, 
since I'm sure we're pressed for time, I should probably switch over to the history of the PSA now. So, but before I do, does anyone have any questions about the museum? I can't see the Q&A board, so Doug, shout them out. Um, none yet. Awesome, great. <laughs> In that case, um, let us start. Uh, now, I find it's easier if we're all starting from a certain baseline with posters. So posters, as we think of them today, first appeared in the late 1860s in Europe. These were large format color lithographs like this image by the father of the poster, Jules Charest, and they were generally used to advertise a variety of events or products from cigarette rolling paper, like this Im image, to hair tonic, uh, this is an 1880s American poster, um, to biscuits, like this image from Lefebvre Utile, the cookie company. While advertising certainly existed prior to this period, it was either something you saw in a magazine or a newspaper or that you came in contact with as a broadside or a printed notice on the street. Um, and in all of these cases, oh, where's my slide? Nope, never mind. That slide is not included. <laughs> um, and in all of these cases, what you saw was typically text rather than image based, meaning that in order to read any of these ads, you had to be literate. Uh, it also meant merely by the fact that you received the information through a periodical like a magazine, that you were an active participant in absorbing that information. So you had to make the effort to gain access to see that ad. Magazines don't just hit you in the face. Now, all of this changed with the advent of color posters. Now the image rather than the text is the dominant force. You don't need to read this poster to say, that says toys um, and the name of the department store, you can tell just by the presence of a happy child on a rocking horse holding a bunch of toys that this is probably an ad for toys. And that's a huge moment for advertising. You now have access to everyone, regardless of literacy, income level, interest. There is no barrier for entry. And the image, and the images rather, um, are on the street, so they can't really be ignored. So if you go outside, you will come in contact with these ads, whether you like it or not. Now, interestingly, it took the government and other organizations interested in informing the public a while to tap into the functional use of posters. We don't really see PSAs as we think of them today until around World War I. That's almost 50 years since large-scale poster advertising first appeared. There are obvious exceptions to this rule, but by and large, there isn't a mass push to inform the public of necessary or helpful in information until the mid to late 19 teens. Now, after this, you start seeing a combination of posters aimed at informing people about public health issues like the Spanish flu, as well as posters instructing people to take advantage of public initiatives like the birth registry, prenatal care options, um, and the push for a living wage as a means of ensuring a good environment for raising a child. This is also the time that you start to see posters telling citizens how they can help the war effort through conservation of food. And you'll notice that the motivating force in these images is a sense of civic duty or patriotism, that by following these guidelines, you are, providing, you are proving yourself to be a good American. Then in the 1930s, FDR's WPA created thousands of posters around New Deal initiatives, many of which highlighted issues of public health and work safety. And these were mostly created at a very local level and were predominantly silk screened rather than printed through lithography. So that meant smaller runs, faster designs. You'll see in the margins that um, many of these were done by uh, certain groups. So for example, many of these were done by the city of Chicago. Others appear more nationally focused. Now, by the time we enter there we go. By the time we enter World War II, poster PSA messaging shifts toward how you, as a non-enlisted citizen, can help the country and your community. So posters about, wait, there you go, carpooling um, to save resources become commonplace. Here they're, selling, they're saying you're helping Hitler win if you don't ride share. Um, we also see posters like this instructing women to save cans for ammunition or kitchen grease for explosives. PSAs also found their ways into army barracks, where we see a ton of images instructing soldiers on matters of sexual health. It's often asked why there are so many STD posters for World War II, and the answer is pretty shocking, because during World War I, at any given time, 15% of US troops were unable to fight because they were being treated for STDs, most of which they got while sleeping with good time girls abroad. 
In fact, there's a quote somewhere from Woodrow Wilson that says that if we had come up with a way to cure VD, we could have gotten out of the war a year earlier. So during World War II, we wanted to make sure that we weren't losing troops to preventable diseases. So posters like this were widespread within all branches of the military. And even when you got home from war, you saw posters like this telling you to get checked before you give your wife the clap. There was also a very effective campaign in Europe and America during World War II about being careful what you say. So if you wrote to your wife that you were heading into battle on a specific date or in a specific location, that could be intercepted and result in your entire platoon being killed. If you said something in your local bar about what your friend in the army told you, someone spying for the enemy could hear it. Even the girl you picked up for a one night stand could be working for the other side. So this concept of leaking information was a real threat since the element of surprise would supposedly win the war. So posters like this indicating those dramatic consequences became really commonplace. Um, here you see a sailor drowning because his ship was torpedoed, uh, a deadly headline on the right pointing to the person who may have caused it, and my favorite, a really cute dog resting in front of a gold star, the symbol of a family who has lost a son in war. Now, PSAs continued to be prevalent in most countries through the 50s and 60s, especially as science started really emphasizing the need for mass public health action. This is how we stopped, yes? Oh, yes, tell me. Before we leave the war, we have a question. Oh, um, give me more, your war questions. Uh, someone said, asked, uh, was there a style guide for, that artists needed to follow to create posters before or during the war? No, not necessarily. The really interesting thing about, uh, particularly World War I, um, all of those posters were, were, they weren't paid for. The uh, Society of Illustrators headed by Charles, uh, Howard Chandler Christie, um, but he basically got all of his illustrator friends to donate their talents to the war effort. So all those, the, the incredible amount of posters that the US created during World War I were, were like free of charge and were based on whatever that designer wanted to do. So there wasn't necessarily a style guide. It was just like, be patriotic, get the message across. And as such, you will see a massive quality difference. Some are absolutely awful. And then some are, are like iconic. Um, and this, the, it sh shifted in World War II because now these artists were, were, pay they were paid commissions, but there still wasn't a, a specific style guide. It was more like fit the brief. And if it was an effective or impactful poster, it was used. I wonder if there was still an authority somewhere uh, giving approval on, on the production. Yeah, I mean, like uh, they, they had to go through the war office. I mean, it was the same in England. It was eventually approved by somebody, but gen particularly in World War I, there was really no, there was nobody that was specifically in charge of that job, I think. Howard Chandler Christie ended up taking over that position for the government or somebody very close to him. So it was kind of like an insider nepotism situation. Um, but uh, there was no like, sp there wasn't like a brief that you had to fill. Okay. Any other questions? That's it for now. Okay. Um, back to the 50s and 60s. Um, so this is how we stop tuberculosis, polio, major diseases that we don't even think of today. And part of eradicating them was educating the public. And that's really what PSAs are. They're a means of educating the public en masse. And it goes back to the idea of not having to seek out information, but just being presented with it. Now, by the time we hit the 70s and 80s here, uh, PSA posters are commonplace and covering a variety of social concerns uh, from everybody's favorite bear on the left telling you how to prevent forest fires to Star Wars characters reminding you to vaccinate your children. Uh, this is also the moment when the idea of celebrity or pop culture entering the PSA space really takes hold. So remember when at the end of G.I. Joe cartoons, you'd see a knowing is half the battle clip, um, or when there'd be a very special episode of a popular teenage show, typically discussing issues of domestic violence, teen pregnancy, drug use. Using those familiar beloved characters to get a message across proved very, very effective. Now, on the other hand, this is also the era when iconic posters like Act Up Now's Silence Equals Death image becomes symbolic as both a protest poster and as a means of getting people to recognize the severity of the AIDS crisis. Now, of course, this is just a small snapshot of the history of PSA posters in the United States with a few things from Europe. But PSAs exist in all countries. So I'm just going to quickly go through a few that either we have in our collection or which I've come across in my research. 
Now, here we have fairly recent posters from Kenya, both of which are in our collection, talking about wildly different things. Uh, the first is informing people that disabilities, here specifically deafness, uh, is not the result of a curse being placed upon a family and that the family of a child with a disability should not be shunned by society. The second is about how sexual harassment in the workplace is unacceptable. Um, here's an Ethiopian image, a pretty recent one, uh, introducing the health benefits of using a designated toilet space rather than just going anywhere you want. And a Nepali poster on the right next to a similar one put out by Planned Parenthood about reproductive rights. Now, this brings us to today. So many groups are creating PSAs in response to the COVID-19 outbreak, especially ones for the digital space like Instagram and Facebook. Uh, the Amplifier Foundation, perhaps best known for its affiliation with the artist Shepard Ferry, has issued an open call to artists to submit poster designs. And many of these actually reference historic posters from World War I and World War II, like obviously this is the iconic Rosie the Riveter image. Now the same goes in England where the War on COVID-19 campaign very clearly takes poster imagery and updates the messaging for the current crisis. Uh, these posters are actually being printed and posted around London right now. Um, then there are also places like Isle of Printing, a letterpress studio in Nashville, which is creating unique posters, so posters not based on historic imagery, to inform the public. So tons of very different parts of the design world are coming together for a common cause, either creating entirely new images or images in concert with designs from our collective history. Now we at Poster House um, asked designer Rachel Gingrich to create a set of digital PSAs for us when we heard about the shocking and incredibly disturbing treatment of Asian Americans as a result of misconceptions that they were responsible for COVID-19. This led to our in-house designer, Mahoshi Fukushima Clark, to design her own PSAs. And both of these are available for download on our website. Um, and variations have been printed and are, might be being pasted up around New York. And now, of course, the big event. Poster House recently partnered with Print Magazine, as you may have seen in the New York Times uh, a few weeks ago, or you might have seen it just walking around New York. To, and we created a series of digital posters around the city, appearing on billboards, Care of Times Square Arts, Link NYC, Silvercast, and Pearl Media. Uh, we got some of the biggest names in graphic design to contribute to this project from Adele Rodriguez to Paula Schur. Their work is both shown here. Um, no, no design has the same exact message. Some are meant to give hope to the community, some instruction on how to properly social distance. Others thank essential workers for their sacrifice. Um, and that pretty much wraps up my very brief, very many history of PSAs. So now you can ask me all the questions. Okay, um, great, thank you. We have, we have one um, that's responding to um, sort of the, the later section of posters you showed asking, is there a way we can start doing this today? And, and I think you kind of answered it by showing some of the stuff Poster House is doing and what contemporary stuff. Yeah, no, tons of organizations are making PSAs. It, they're, they're less, of, I don't really see a lot of great ones coming out from government agencies like we, like we used to see. They're usually from private design houses, um, like people taking it upon themselves to, to fit a need. Um, and so I, I mean, I would love to see it if, if the government took a, a little bit more initiative with printing more impactful posters, but. Um, that, uh, that sort of brings up a question about uh, public space, like you kind of need a public space for posters. And if you're not living in a city where you're, you're walking around and seeing things on the street, where is that? Is yeah, no, I mean, you don't really see, uh, like a lot of a lot of posters in like the middle of Nebraska, um, but but yeah, I mean posters are they're they're a city they're a city feature, um, and the, and they have to be in a city generally that has a lot of of walking as an element to how it, how it functions. Like I know that New York is more of a poster printed on the streets town than Los Angeles. Um, I know that because when we were doing when we've tried to collect posters by artists in Los Angeles, they're like, well, they aren't street facing because that's just not how posters here function for the most part. Um, so there is that difference and it does vary city by city, but we are seeing a lot of great, there's a great PSA campaign um, out right now that's um, been done in Leeds up in, in, um, in England, um, which I don't think of as like a massive city, so. Um, yes, and then we have a question about this. Uh, it's related, uh, what is public space now that many of us are locked inside? <laughs> well, 
Um, New York just entered phase one. Um, but yeah, no, uh, we've uh, definitely seen like a lot of the posters that I was even made aware of that were being printed, I, I found through Instagram. So using the digital space to promote that which is in the external space um, is kind of vital right now, especially if you want your message to spread um, regardless of location. Um, so I'm, I mean, I wouldn't have known about campaigns that were happening in England if I didn't see them in my phone first. Right, right. Okay, um, how is Poster House collecting things right now? Do you have any specific uh, programs to collect these kinds of things? The, the PSAs being? Yes. Oh yeah, we actively are collecting those. I mean, right now we're also actively collecting posters from the various protests that are happening all, the, all around the world right now. As I mentioned really early in my talk, we did this whole show um, for the Women's March posters from the 2017 March because we were given a collection of over 3,000 posters from that March and our collections manager whittled it down to a, a manageable show. Um, we obviously, we don't want 3,000 more posters. Um, that's a lot. But especially because handmade posters are, are very, um, they're, they're, temp they're uh, temperamental, like they can be made with things that are not possibly archival. Um, so we are being a little bit more selective in what we choose, but we want to make sure that we represent every possible voice um, and like every, every point of view in, in the current protests in our collection. Okay, great. Uh, we have a very specific question about the G.I. Joe poster you showed. Oh, that's not a G.I. Joe poster. That was like literally a screen grab from the TV. Oh, okay. It was uh, a question. They might have missed something. Um, what it says, knowing is half the answer. Knowing what? What was the? What, what was? The oh, you don't remember? You never watched GI Joe, and like at the end, they would be like, "And now you know." Um, it, they would have like after the credits, they would have like a little moment about like sharing is caring, or like some something like a moral lesson you teach a young person, and then they were like, "Knowing is half the battle." Like don't don't like light fireworks off in your backyard because it blow your hand off. Nobody watched G.I. Joe? No? <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> okay. Um, we have another question uh, asking about uh, speed of production. So PSAs obviously have to respond to something uh, quite immediate or that's in the news at the moment. So what was, how quickly were these things produced? Well, I mean, ones being made now are produced by the day. I mean, they, they, the turnaround time, especially if you're doing printing and it's digital printing, that can be really quick. If you're doing silk screening, you can, you can do that at your house if you know how to set up a silk screen station. <laughs> um, but stuff from the, from the 18, from the 19 teens, I mean, that, that took a few weeks, um, but it wasn't like the Spanish flu was going away. So they, they had time. Okay. Um, I, I, I know some of the, the, the posters from the, the Russian revolution, the, the, the Rasta posters, the news posters that were produced really quickly and put up in windows. The were, toss window posters? Yes, those were produced really, really quickly because they were trying to get news out, right? Yeah, but most of those, I, I wouldn't say that they were PSAs. I would say that they were propaganda, Probably. but they followed like a paint by numbers kind of um, uh, system. So you would have like the central office that would tell, like create the template or the, 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 like the message that you were meant to express. And then people would create them in a factory like way. Um, so that they, it was just like a, I mean, those are painted. They aren't printed. Okay. Okay. So, but that does bring up a point about how you as a curator are having to differentiate between these different, these different categories of posters. Yeah. There's propaganda, there's PSA, which sometimes resembles propaganda. Yeah, it's a fine line, but like a distinct line. I keep, I, we did a, a program last week where someone's like, oh, talk about the PSAs being made now for the protests. I'm like, well, those are, those are protest posters. Those aren't PSAs. PSAs have to inform the public of, of, in, of like useful information on how, like if, some, if someone had a poster out right now that was like, these are the places you would contact for, like go to this this museum has their lobby open with free water um and bathrooms for protesters that that's a that's a psa but if it's just like a um if it's a demand for a social change that's a protest poster right right so it's about it's it's the the request being made through the poster yes changes its kind of, uh, right um Someone has asked if you've been able to get the designers to donate their time to make PSAs or are they paid? I think they're, they're, talk, they're asking about the ones 
that it's, yeah, it, it's it's a little bit of each so for when we, i show the posters by rachel gingrich the ones that we commissioned those so we paid her to design posters in response to the way asians americans were being treated um for we we are working right now with with designers that we are paying to produce um different types of psa posters um for the um campaign with times square arts that was donated time okay because like i can't afford i can't afford paula Scher. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Great to hear that uh, people are being so generous. Yes. No. I mean, we we we. I mean, we're, we're incredibly grateful for their their time and talent. They were they did an amazing thing for for us and for pr primarily to thank essential workers in the city. Great. Um, okay, we have some more questions. Um, do PSA posters coincide with TV commercials or vice versa? Well, most of the ones I showed were pre-television, but <laughs> uh, but. Um, I mean, yes, yeah, sure. I mean, the PSA posters that we just did in Times Square, AMC is showing them at like seven o'clock every night as a, as a, as like a static commercial. So um, yeah, fresh off the presses. I just heard that a few days ago. Um, so yeah, you can, I mean, messaging is, is messaging. If, if, if somebody feels that it deserves to be on television and radio, it will be projected there too. Um, and, and having that kind of harmony of message is essential to getting it to the largest possible audience. So I'm sure that if you go back to a lot of those early posters that would have happened pre in the pre TV era, like I'm sure there was a radio commercial that also said like, right. coughs and sneezes, spread diseases. Right, right. It was, it, by the way, it was really great seeing those, those early posters about epidemics and disease, yeah. just to see how the, some of the basic concerns were the same about respiratory spread. Oh yeah, no, I did a whole, if you go to our blog, if you go back far enough, I did a whole blog post about how like all the things that we should be doing now were things in posters a hundred years ago. <laughs> um, okay, another question. Um, they're interested to know how Poster House procures these posters from different countries, like the Kenyan ones, I suppose, or Ethiopia. Um, do you um, borrow for an exhibition and then, and then keep them or do you, are you, just collecting actively all the time in places like that? That super layered question. So when I showed the the posters, like the advertising agency posters that are coming out now from like, like the Japanese anima poster, my favorite, um, we contact ad agencies that, and like but big ad agencies like Ogilvy and Mather. And I see in like trade magazines that they've created this great poster in their Latin American office and I want it. So then I, I say that we, we pay shipping and then they send it to us because they've already printed it. Um, for things that are a little older, um, they are like we, we only collect first printing. So it's not like we can contact like the public, of the, the, the public health department in Kenya and get a poster that was printed 15 years ago. They just wouldn't have it. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of dealers that, that were collecting 15 years ago, stuff that wasn't especially mainstream. And so we reach out to them and we find what they have that could fill pockets in our collection. In general though, we collect specifically for exhibitions. So um, I'm like one thing I'm working on right now is a show on the history of advertising fashion to men, which is very different than advertising fashion to women. So I'm, I've been collecting posters um, about the men's fashion industry. Um, so we, 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 don't, we don't plan on being an encyclopedic collection. We don't need a blue chip collection because I, was a, I worked for a dealer for a decade. I know who I sold all those blue chip pieces to. Um, and people are very generous with lending us stuff. So if we wanted all the toulouse Lautrecs in the world, we could find them. Um, but finding the esoteric stuff is harder because there isn't a guy collecting like Kenyan public health posters. Mm -hmm. um, so we collect those things that we think are more interesting and historically important. Great. I, I think that's so fantastic that someone's paying attention to this, all this stuff and, and trying to keep a record of it. Yeah. Uh, this is a good question. Um, and it's kind of related to the Rosie the Riveter one you showed, uh, Rosie with a mask on. Are there copyright issues around images from old posters? And, uh, you know, the Rosie is, appears in so many memes. And well, um, the, so Posters made for the U.S. government are free to use. So all of those World War I and World War II posters, that you can do whatever you want with them, um, because they were made for the government. Uh, like they were made for the people, so they are the people's 
that people can reuse and, and, and use them as, as, as they see fit. Also, I mean, if you hit the copyright date correctly, you might be pre-copyright. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you get into later stuff, then no, you can't use it. Um, <laughs> uh, like I can't just pick like a, like in the current show we have up now on the Swiss grid, I can't use a Joseph Muller Brockman poster or an Armin Hoffman poster without going through a lot of licensing permissions. I can't just like put it on a tote bag. Oh, uh, that's interesting. Huh. Yeah, I haven't seen any Mueller Brockman uh, like mugs, the copies lately. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's I mean, you, there's an estate for a lot of these artists, or or the artist in Armin Hoffman's case, he's still alive. Um, right. He's like 101, but he's still alive. Uh, there, there, we've got several questions around social media um, yeah. that uh, might kind of be addressed together. Um, one is. How has social media changed the PSA? So there's sometimes no longer one image, but many. And then also someone is asking, how do you archive stuff that's, that's um, digital and uh, social? Let me see the exact question. Was, well, how no, how no, might we, you be able to archive contemporary digital only posters for future reference? That is not a problem for me. <laughs> that's somebody else's problem. Yeah. Uh, no, we, we chose that, we, I mean, for me, a poster is, is by definition printed. I know that, I mean, obviously there are amazing things being made for Instagram. I see incredible designs there every day, um, but that is beyond the scope of the museum as our mission statement currently stands. Mission statements can also evolve, mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the ephemeral nature of a poster and the fact that it was printed and shown outside is to me integral to the definition of a poster. Um, the other places will be, I mean, I think there's like a museum of the meme that collects memes. I don't know how you collect a meme. I don't, I'm like, do you just have a hard drive? But um, like those things, other institutions are, are actively collecting in that space. Um, and it, it is beyond my purview. Mm -hmm. um. Someone wonders if there have been any reliable studies on the effectiveness of different PSA posters. I wonder if that might be easier to answer in the case of the historic ones. There, or have, there, have been, there are lots of books on like the effect. I don't know if there's like actual metrics on specific posters, but I know that there are books in the thirties at least that like showcase statistics real or made up. I don't know. I mean, I could have been a marketing ploy just to like this type of poster is more effective than this type of poster. This is why you should use our ad agency to instead of this ad agency to create your poster. But I'm sure that those were like, cr like created facts to, to like sell your own brand um, mm -hmm. or to sell your own services. So I, I don't know if there's like an actual like one-to-one, -one, like this poster resulted in this many sales of this, but uh, I'd love it if there were. <laughs> Are recruitment, do you consider recruitment posters for the military PSAs? No, those are propaganda. Okay. Uh, someone wonders if, uh, if there is a book about these, uh, or the, on the history of PSAs, and maybe if you have any books you might recommend. Um, on the history of PSAs, not so much because it kind of like goes, it, it, it dovetails with so many, uh, there are, first and foremost, there are, no, there are no amazing poster books out there. It's like very hard to, even when we introduce like a new member of staff to the museum, finding out something that they can read to really get a handle on what a poster is. Because um, I find that a lot of people don't know necessarily like the, the parameters of a poster. There's always like the, like, no, that's a decorative print. No, that, like, that, that's a limited edition print. Like, it, that's not a poster. It has to be street facing. It is not precious. Um, but there's a, a poster by, uh, a poster, a book by Alan Vey. Um, I think it's called Graphics, but, it, but it's a very thin book. And we give it to every new hire because it is the greatest book on just like, giving you the basics on like the complete history of posters from the 1860s to the pro till now 10 years ago, present day from all around the world. So it's really great as far as breaking down styles and who the main players were. Um, but as far as PSAs specifically, you would have to read, there's a book on public health posters, which covers a lot of it. But again, it's very, it's going to be like dom predominantly French, English and Italian and American posters. You don't get a lot of diversity there. Um, as well as there's a book on, or a few books on um, propaganda created for, that the US created during World War I, which has some PSAs in it. So you kind of have to like layer your research to like get the information you want. 
Right, right. Okay. Here's an interesting question. It also comes back to this question of categories and where PSAs fit in or how you define a PSA. Can posters made by conspiracy theorists be considered PSAs? Do they have to be fact-based? <laughs> I mean, I would hope they were fact-based, but I mean, the, there are, I think it depends on who's collecting them. If I'm, if I'm, a consp if I'm like a flat earther, um, mm. then I would think that the poster I'm creating is a fact. So it, like, I, I don't wanna, I mean, obviously like I know the earth isn't flat, but I'm not gonna say that that's not, doesn't qualify necessarily as a PSA because it's a PSA from the perspective of the person promoting it um, or producing it. Um, that does not mean I would include it in an exhibition about facts, uh, but, but yeah, no, you can, you can have like unfactual PSAs. There, 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 I'm sure that there are, um, I'm, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I'm sure that there are public health PSA posters where the science of that part of public health has been completely debunked 100 years later. Right. So at the time it would have functioned as a PSA. Right, and it does seem that if, if one is produced uh, in a, in a, and distributed in sort of a broad way, it does have to be based on some sort of generally accepted truth or fact. Yeah. But also like a PSA because it's usually instructional, like cover your mouth when you cough. Mm -hmm. I don't know what a what a conspiracy theorist poster was like. Wear a tin, wear like a tinfoil helmet. Like I don't, I don't know what the what the message would be that would be informative to the public at large as an instructional precaution. Um, well, one thing that comes to mind when you're showing some of the vaccination posters. Oh, you know, <laughs> people might disagree with that now. Whether it's even really something yeah. that wants to do. Right. Sure. Uh, someone asked if you could repeat the titles of those books again. Uh, perhaps I like look them up bit. online. <laughs> um, so the Alan Vey book is called, Alan Vey is W-E-I-L-L, -L, and it's Graphics, A Century of Poster and Advertising Design. It's out of print, but you can find like a million copies on Amazon that are older. Um, and the public health poster book is... Of course, I can't find it on Amazon. Um, I think it's called like a, a, a century of public health posters. Um, and then the, the, I think it's the, the American one for war posters. I have no idea. I would have to, I, I left all my books in New York when I fled the city. Um, so I don't have them on, on, on hand. But there is a book, like if you search for hard enough, there's a small book about like creating advertising for the war um, and, the, and the tactics that were specifically used to create those posters. Okay, thank you. Sorry. We haven't talked about type. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, you're, you, were, um, you were very honest when you said, you, you know, that type is not a, a very specific specialty of yours, but I know that you've been learning a lot about type. I, I did decide that I would study under Paul Shaw, the type master, uh, and I took his history of type, type, of type class at um, the new school last semester. So I know something about type. Yeah. Uh, but, but in most of the posters that I, that I focus on, that, that's not type, Those are, that's all hand lettering. So like I, you don't really get type in posters besides like the like American broadsides um, until the 50s and 60s. So um, I'm, I'm pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was just, I was going to ask you that if you had any general observation about uh, type in, in, or lettering in these posters and, and just drawing that distinction is, is really important that it's most. Yeah, no, the, the hand lettering is really interesting because in a lot of cases, like if you look at MUCA posters from the 1890s, um, the letter, like the, he doesn't use the same letter A in the, in the same poster, like the A is one way and then it's a completely different way. So there's no um, uniformity or consistency in how he makes his letter forms. Um, so, and, and you'll see that until the deco period, you start getting some regularity, but still, it's still hand painted. Even when you get to Jan Chickel, whose stuff looks so printed, it looks like it could, it's definitely type. It, it's not, he hand did it because he had the skill to do that. Right. Um, and in the current Swiss show that you did the exhibition design for, that's gorgeous. Um, the, the lettering is a combination of metal type for the small type, um, wood type for some of the larger stuff and then just um uh line of cut for the really really big stuff so it's a you get like a love i love in that particular show the combination of printing methods in a single image right right and don't you think that some of the charm of these psa posters 
is because they're done quickly and they're lettering. So you get some pretty funky lettering. Oh, you get yeah. crazy lettering. I also love how type has evolved in posters. There was, I don't have a picture of it on hand, but I once saw a travel poster from the 1880s or maybe 1890s. And it was for some like beachside resort. And they made the lettering look exactly like what would later become the Goosebumps font, like the Goosebumps children book font. It's like the, the lettering that's like dripping and melting and is meant to be like a scary font was advertising this like gorgeous beachside resort. It was like, oh, that, that didn't mean the same thing then, did it? Right, right. It just meant heat or something. <laughs> um, here we have a uh, question that's sort of related to a question we often get when we talk, give type talks. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite typeface? But here the question is, and you, you know, you, you can defer. It is, it's just a hard question. What's your favorite poster of all time? <laughs> you can oh, choose. Well, that's, not actually, that, that's not a super hard question. So if, if you haven't followed the Poster House Instagram account, um, when we closed, I had to start, to, I like came up with the, the off the cuff idea that like, okay, I'm going to film a bunch of posters in the, of, of like mini two minute videos in the museum where I go through the timeline, just like talk about why this poster is cool. But after a week, that, that's the timeline. Um, so then I started having to do mini videos of the posters in my house. And now we're at my mom's house. And so every day I'm doing posters of the posters that I live with. Um, so, but my favorite poster of all time, um, there are like five. But um, I, one I don't own, Capiella's Cube, I believe it is the dawn of modernism and advertising. It's incredibly important. It's K-U-B, if you search Capiello and Cube. It's What's just, the, first, uh, the first word you said, Capiello? Yeah, Capiello is the father of modern advertising. Um, so Capiello, he created like, if you, if you just Google image search Capiello, C-A-P-P-I-E-L-L-O, um, you'll get a zillion things that you will have seen before. If you've been in an Italian restaurant, you've seen a reproduction of these. Um, and the cube poster, which is for bullion cubes, um, it's as big as a wall. So picture like the wall of your living room. Um, it's huge and it's just like a bull's head with the bullion cube as the eye. And it, it's just amazing in person. It changed the way advertising functioned at that moment. Um, there's a poster coming up at Swan Galleries next week that I am hopefully going to buy. Um, and it's uh, by Schnockenberg. I think he's my favorite poster designer. He did Germany, German posters during kind of like the Weimar period. Um, you broke up just a minute there. What was the name again for Schnock Schnockenberg? Schnockenberg. Um, okay. Or as I affectionately call him, the Schnack Attack. Um, but uh, his posters, they're like, Creepy. I, I like really creepy, weird stuff. So I mean that I I don't go, come into my house is a bit of a horror show. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, someone oh just once again sorry someone has said they missed the title of the poster book that you give to all new hires. Yes. Okay. It is by Alan Vey, W E I L L, um, and it's called. Gra I, have to, I have to get back on Amazon. Um, graphics, a century of poster and advertising design. It is out of print, but it's really tiny. Um, so it's like you can fit in your coat pocket and it's great for just a pure introduction to posters. There's somebody in the uh, chat room, Marianne Deer, and she worked at the Welcome Collection in London. Cool. And she said that they have amassed a big collection of public health posters over the last 100 years. Worth a look if you haven't seen our online collection. Awesome. Thank you. I, I will. That's great. Thank you, Carol. Um, see, I'm just looking for any, any questions we might not have answered. Because um, we, we have a little, we have a few minutes left. Uh, this is, I'll, I'll just turn this into a general question. Do you accept um, people sending you thing, posters from, uh, from other countries? Um, if we accepted everything carte blanche, we'd run out of storage space very quickly. Um, so if somebody has something they want to donate to the museum, um, if you just email me or collections manager, we just pass a lot between me, the collections manager and the education department, we see if it would fit within anything that we, like a, an area that is lacking in our collection, something we could use in, in either education or in an exhibition, um, just to make sure it's appropriate. And also to make sure that like the restoration bill wouldn't be a million dollars. 
um, because sometimes preservation and restoration on some of these things is insane. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's a vetting process, but it's pretty easy. So email me. I'm Angelina at posterhouse.org. Okay, thank you. Um, how did you find that, you mentioned a poster from Leeds, or that Leeds was doing something, the city of Leeds in England. How did you find out about it? And are there poster specific websites you follow to keep up with current poster trends? Um, there are no specific websites I follow. There is um, a, for, for very, con for advertising, for, for contemporary advertising posters. So stuff by Ogilvy and Matt, there's so, stuff by BBDO. Um, there's a magazine called Lusier's Archive. I'm probably mispronouncing it. It's like Lusier's. Is, um, um, is it the Netherlands or Belgium? Yeah somewhere up there. Um, and they basically gather the best in advertising be it made now, and they have a whole out of home section, which is posters. So I look there for international posters. I would obviously never, I'm not gonna see like a cat food ad from Brazil in New York. So it's a great way to see the posters that are being made now, if you want that type of poster. Um, for um, the lead stuff, they tagged me and they, they tagged the museum and something and I looked. Um, so people reach out to us on Instagram all the time and, and seeing what people send us is really how I expand our, um, like our knowledge of what's being made now. Um, so that's how I, that's how I found them. There are a lot of dealers who have uh, social media feeds, right, where they're constantly showing things as well. Oh yeah, I, I, I was, I mean, I worked for one of them, so yeah. Right, right. right. Okay. And... Do you have any thoughts on brands becoming involved in PSA posters during times of crisis? Ooh, I have thoughts. I.e. not just government agencies. So there are, I do have, I, I, I feel like there's a conflict there. So when a brand gets involved with a PSA um, or any kind of like public notification, um, there's always the like, are you doing this because you're a brand and you want your brand to be in a, seen in a positive light? Like, are you also doing like the back end work of this as well? Like, are you, are you, you're, you're, are you walking the walk as well as talking the talk? So there's always that like push pull of, of how representative of the brand's actual ethos and mission this, like, are you doing it for the likes? Um, so those are my thoughts with, with brands getting involved in PSAs. That doesn't mean that they don't create really interesting PSAs, but, um, and the same with protest posters. A lot of brands got involved with like the Women's March and started creating posters that you could print at home. Um, but were those also brands that were making efforts to hire more women um, or to, to as well, like a, and a host of other issues that were supported during the Women's March. So um, there, there is that tension that I, I, I sometimes have difficulty accepting, but that, that is just me. That is not the museum's stance on this. The, yes, it, it's the motivations become a little murkier. Yeah. So you, you decide. That's a great PR if you if you're a brand. If I'm McDonald's and suddenly you can print out a hundred um, posters for Black Lives Matter, like, do, it, am I really supporting Black Lives Matter and the mission of the company, or am I just doing this so that the brand gets great PR? Like, there's there is that that conflict, and I, I you never know. Like, I don't know what McDonald's stance is on 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 the current political situation. Right, uh, it's so so interesting. The resources you've been mentioning are people are very interested in those, and so someone has asked. Uh, that if you could repeat the, the, the poster magazine that you mentioned, the one that I thought might come from the Netherlands, and I'll type it into the... Yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to spell. It's, I pronounce it Luzier's Archive, but it might be pronounced differently because my Dutch isn't great. Um, but uh, they, they have a website, too, that you can see, um, uh, like, every poster being made now, and they update it daily. They also have, like, commercials magazine ads, like they, they cover the whole gamut of advertising, but they're, they're really good. Also Campaign Magazine out of London um, covers the contemporary ag advertising scene. Campaign Magazine. Yeah, Campaign. When, I mean, Print Magazine always has interesting things on, uh, they, do, they do a lot of stuff that's more, but th that's more in line with the PSA, like ethos. Um, like they cover things that aren't necessarily as mainstream or as commercial. Um, obviously Stephen Heller is like the god of knowing where everything is, so he, he his, his articles daily are, are great. Great, okay. And, and someone very kindly put uh, the URL for the Leutzer archive into the chat. So that's there, as well as your email. You, you, oh, you thank you, harass me. In there now. And the title of the book from Alan Bile that you give to your employees. Thanks. So that's all there. 
uh, I think we've answered, uh, yeah, I think we've answered uh, most of the questions. Um, Great. So anything you'd like to add? No. Anything you, <laughs> You know anything about uh, the the immediate future for Poster House? Like the real uh, yes. So as of yesterday, we are if we are going to be part of phase four of opening. It looks like we will be opening sometime in September, unless I mean anything can happen. But it looks like we will be reopening around then. We will keep our current exhibitions. So that's the Sleeping Giant posters in the Chinese economy, as well as the Swiss Grid up through um, basically Valentine's Day, and then we will switch back to our regular schedule. Um, and yeah, so that, that's the, that's the current plan. Anything could happen. Um, we obviously have all the bells and whistles of, of heightened sanitation and all the, all the things that everybody's doing right. We, we're doing, um, and in the meantime, though, we're doing an insane amount of online programming. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually leaving this and going to give a tour for the low vision community of our current shows, um, over zoom. Wow. That's, so, that's amazing. So are you as busy as ever? Oh, I'm busier. I, I am so much busier. Um, but uh, yeah, we have, we, have a, we have a talk with typographics coming up on, on the entire PSA campaign that we did in Times Square. So a bunch of the designers are going to be speaking at typographics with us um, and Debbie Millman about um, the process of designing for, um, in response to, to the coronavirus outbreak. Um, yeah, so we, we have a ton of stuff coming up all on the events page of our website. And all our, of our events are free, so sign on up. Great, okay, thank you. And um, we did have one more question asking if this recording will be available on the website to watch later, and I'll answer for the TDC. <laughs> and uh, yes, the answer is yes. It takes us a little time to, to process them and get them up um, available, but we, do, we are doing that. Cool. Well, thank you, Angelina. This thank is you for having me. Thank you for doing this from your home or your mother's home. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this is not my house. You see my, we have like my sister's awards in the background. I get nothing. <laughs> Definitely a, a shrine to my sister. Um, I, all right. Well, it was great seeing you guys. Love to see you, Carol. Mwah. Good to see you too. Take care. You too. All okay. right. Bye, guys. Bye, Thank everybody. Bye-bye.